Round presents Born to the Blade, Episode 4. Chapter 1. Chris. Chris Dan marched into the public chambers of the Warder Circle. Three steps ahead, Nick held the Rumican flag high, a golden chimera on a red and white field. Musicians on pipes walked alongside Chris, playing the melody to the Rumican epic of Yell the Wise. Alex and other attendants followed, the Rumican entourage for the gauntlet eight strong. This last year of Chris's life had built to this day. Every drill, every sparring session, every working dinner and stop in their tour across Rumica, every session cramming names and figures and laws and histories of trade deals. Yet it was all for nothing unless they succeeded today and in the days ahead. The chamber was full, with dozens of Rumicans in the guest gallery, more than Chris had seen together since leaving home. The cheering was as loud as the invitational tournaments back home, contests that were each a step Chris had taken on the path to be here today. Chris wore a close-fitting jacket in red and white and a brand new set of breeches, the outfit specially made for the gauntlet. Yokno Venz met Chris and their entourage at the edge of the stage. Chris bowed to Yokno, who answered with a deep nod. Then the seneschal turned and addressed the room, his rich voice carrying throughout the chambers. Chris Den of Rumika has requested the opportunity to address the circle. All six of the current warders were present, their boxes full. Each was dressed formally, though Chris could see combat tunics and leathers here and there beneath the finery. Such was the life of a warder, the life Chris was about to claim for their own. Both flash and substance, silk and steel. Chris stepped up onto the platform, the eyes of the entire room pressing in on them like an advancing pike wedge. But this was Chris's day, not theirs. Warders of the circle, friends and colleagues and our esteemed guests, I speak with the voice of Rumika, a proud people who are ready to step into the broader world and take their place among the great nations of the circle. Chris drew their sword and carved the sigil of challenge, one of the most intricate sigils they had ever learned, sweeping arcs with precise angles, triangles inside of squares, inside of circles that had to connect just so. They'd practiced the sigil a hundred times, then a hundred more. As they finished the final swoop of the blade, the sigil flashed. The light arced to the altar of challenge, forming a glowing ring showing the flags of the six nations of the circle. As each nation met Chris's challenge, their icon would glow in support or darken in opposition. The challenge of the gauntlet is called, Yokno declared, ringing the ceremonial bell. Who shall answer? Ojo stepped forward, twin blades on his hip. Kulo answers. He showed a hint of a smile. More than anyone, Ojo had helped Chris prepare for this day, so it was fitting Chris would test their mettle against him first. Kulo claiming the first position in the gauntlet was a major win. The other nations of the circle decided among themselves the order that would follow. The senior Kuloi warders stepped up onto the platform and extended a hand to shake. May you do your people proud, he said, softly enough that only Chris and Yokno could hear. Chris smiled. I intend to. On his side of the field, Ojo stretched, but his face was calm. A Dejike stood beside him holding Ojo's blades, animated as he talked about something. Yokno walked to the center of the dueling arena with the bell. The gauntlet begins. Chris Dan of Rumika challenges, and Ojo Kante of Kulo answers. Chris and Ojo shook hands as Yokno explained the rules. Each duel would be by bladecraft to the first touch. For each duel, the warder could call a halt and cast their vote in support without a touch being needed. Chris knew this all by heart. Hurry up and start already, Chris thought, barely keeping the words from their lips. Endless moments later, they were ready to begin. Chris had their plan in mind, empowering sigils for speed to accentuate their advantage, strength to compensate for their weaknesses, then magical attacks as they closed. Stay just outside Ojo's range, then move in for a quick strike, and then out of measure immediately. In and out. Don't get bogged down. But even the best plans were like paper umbrellas in the rain. Yokno's bell rang, and Chris started inscribing their first sigil. Gale step for speed, then Grizzly's might for strength. Ojo was already closing, cutting his own Gale step in bamboo form. Ojo was trying to counter Chris's advantages. 
Chris had the best sense of Ojo's style after watching him duel Lavinia and spar with Adechike, but it was because of this familiarity that Chris knew to be wary. Ojo's two blades could work in concert or on their own, one cutting a sigil while the other attacked or parried. Chris would have to meet two blades with one. Ojo had a longer reach but a larger body to protect. Chris's blade was longer, which would counter some of the reach advantage, but Ojo was also an accomplished wrestler of no small acclaim. First came Chris's big opening gambit, meant to not only take immediate control of the duel, but to awe of the other warders. Chris flowed from Grizzly's might immediately into Frost Cage, a rare sigil Chris had learned from a Tsukiseni at Rumika's last invitational. Tsukiseni legend claimed that Frost Cage was first used by blade crafters who wished to be preserved until the world was made whole once more. Grown tired of centuries of life due to the Tsukiseni birthright, they wished to skip ahead to a future that might never come. Chris narrowed their eyes as they traced the intricate fractal snowflake pattern at the core of the sigil. The sigil flashed with light, and across the field, ice formed around Ojo's hands. Chris had not just mastered the sigil, they'd modified it. Not only did the sigil block Ojo's hands and blocks of ice, the ice froze into one piece, locking the big man's hands together. But Ojo was not scared or angry. He merely laughed. Excellent. Even Taro hardly ever uses this one. Ojo wouldn't be laughing if he were worried. Chris closed quickly, but kept their guard up. Ojo might want Chris to win, but his reputation would suffer if he lost so easily. Frost Cage was meant not only to hobble a blade crafter's ability to fight, but also to remove the precise dexterity it took to carve sigils. And yet, Ojo moved his arms at the elbow, tracing two tiny sigils with an exactitude Chris had thought impossible. Blade crafter's precision came from moving the blade with the fingers and wrist, never the elbow. The sigils flashed, which Chris recognized as shattered chains. As they activated, the ice crumbled and fell. Ojo was free once more. Chris's best opening had failed, hadn't even worried their opponent. But Chris didn't have time to mope as Ojo took a compass step forward, thrusting Chris's shoulder. Chris parried with room to spare, room they needed to dodge Ojo's other blade. Chris cut at Ojo's hand as they dodged back, but Ojo turned the blow aside, continuing to press forward into range. Chris danced back, double time to cut the sigil mud pit the way Lavinia had done, but Ojo was too close. His blade beat Chris's aside, fouling the sigil. Ojo continued to press. Chris backed off, keeping Ojo at a distance with precise counter thrusts to the bigger man's wrists, which Ojo warded off by pulling the blows or halting his advances. The in and out strategy was now working. Time for something bolder, Chris thought. Not just for this duel, but to show the other warders, to show everyone in the audience just what Rumika could do. Chris planted both their feet, and then, using the still-active sigils of agility and strength, they leaped up and over Ojo. Ojo countered with his own leap, thrusting at Chris, but they flipped out of the way, blades clashing in midair. Chris launched into a thrust as they landed, aiming low under Ojo's guard to catch him across the hip. Ojo parried the blow, but just barely, using both of his blades. That's it. Chris took the moment, rolling forward with her blade held up and a hanging guard to protect against a counter from Ojo. Staying low, they swung the blade around to cut at an extreme angle, hoping to flank the big man enough to land the blow. Not quite. Ojo parried the blow with both blades, slid his top blade back in toward Chris's guard, and then snapped up to land a thrust across their shoulders while they were off balance from the roll. The bell rang twice. Damn it, Chris thought. Their gambit had failed. They'd used a rare sigil, and Ojo had negated it without missing a beat. Chris had broken the rhythm of the fight again and again, but never converted to a touch. Not the greatest start. Had they been too bold? Too confident? Ojo shook Chris from their worries, saying, That frost cage was exquisite. The big man offered Chris a hand up, bracing my hands together. If I hadn't spent years learning to carve with a locked wrist, oh, that'd have been it right there. Chris gave a weak smile, still embarrassed. Ojo turned to the crowd. Chris Den is one of the finest young blade crafters I've ever had the pleasure of dueling. But in addition to the Rumican skill, Chris has also shown me their warmth, their openness. We must learn to cherish one another's differences so that we may learn from one another and be stronger together. Chris traced Ojo's line of sight to Lavinia, arms crossed, death in her eyes. Kulo stands in support of Rumika's claim. Chris's world shook as if they were on a swaying ship. 
They planted their feet and steadied, skin hot with embarrassment giving way to surprise and joy. They'd hoped Ojo might pledge support even if Chris lost, but had never expected it. Not after failing on a risky gamble. They started and failed several times to speak, finally managing to say, Thank you. Ojo nodded. See to that shoulder. And a word of advice? The senior warders are wise. Flashy tricks like that only work if you have an escape plan. It almost worked, Chris thought. But almost wasn't good enough. They couldn't count on any of the others giving support, even if Chris lost their bouts. They had to win the other duels outright. Chris returned Ojo's nod, then withdrew to their bench. Nick and a Rumikun physician were standing by to patch up their wounds throughout the gauntlet. One duel done, five remaining. And they only needed three more votes. Chapter 2. Ojo. Ojo and Penelope took lunch in the Bonian chambers. Adecheke was reviewing reports on import-export revenues from home. From what he'd said that morning, it still wasn't enough to buy the airstone they needed from anyone who was offering. Vanian attendants laid out a spread of succulent braised meats and crisp greens fresh from the embassy's gardens. The Vanian diet was heavy in meats and vegetables, hardly any breads or rice. It kept them lean and powerful. A wave of sadness passed over Ojo as they ate. He'd taken meals like this for granted. But now he counted them like petals falling from a wilted rose. What would he be to her once she departed for home to have their child? Friend? Former colleague? He shook it off. Worrying now was stealing from the present to appease a future that might never come. He poured himself a glass of Kuloi cider from his own growler. What did you think of the duel? He asked. The Frost Cage variant was a fine bit of work, but they were too brash, too male. Penelope sipped her tea. And you were holding back. Ojo shrugged, then sipped cider. It was their first duel. No need to run them ragged. Lavinia will see to that soon enough. It's high time the circle expanded to seven. How many times in the past year, five years, has the circle been deadlocked three to three? The Imperial block against the rest of us. Romica at the table would let us bring Lavinia's bullying to heel. Penelope gestured with her long fork as she stabbed the plate of lamb to serve several large pieces onto her plate. Just wanting a tiebreaker isn't a good enough reason to give a nation a seat at the table. And there are more than a few of my people who would take my supporting a Rumikin as grounds to have me removed. Ojo nodded. There were Apolitoi here on Toife, not just in Bania. Unfortunately, every nation had its extremists. And that's why we have the duel. Chris can prove himself. Rumika could have joined the Circle generations ago, but they chose to keep to themselves. And now, with Rumika's population boom and their increased airstone production, if they want to join the rest of the world at a time like this, I think we should take that as a blessing. Penelope shook her head. Rumika's ascent will upset the balance we found with the Murtika. The Matriarchs and I have worked a long time to improve relations with the Empire. And this could put that in danger. But that's just the point. With Rumika's resources, we don't have to be beholden to the Empire anymore. Kulo, Vanya, and Rumika together can challenge the Empire, even without Sukisen's aid. Chris is already amenable to such an alliance. Penelope said nothing in response, her way of telling him the topic was closed. If he couldn't rally Penelope's support, Chris would need to beat Taro, Kensuke, and Takeshi to win. Lavinia hadn't lost a duel in years, and Chris was nowhere near ready to best her. Maybe one day, with training and patience... Any deal large enough to address Kulo's crisis would need the guarantees of a warder's authority. Without that, it could take weeks of proposals and counterproposals instead of Chris and Ojo talking everything out over tea. And Kulo needed the airstone now. Chapter 3. Chris. Their shoulder bandaged and only slightly sore thanks to the physician's care, Chris stretched out for the second duel with Penelope Kirko Sivania. This evening, they would face Warder He Notaro of Sukisen. With some good luck, they could have all but one of the votes they needed before the day was done. The Imperial Nations had yet to inform Chris of the order they'd be facing their warders, still playing it close to the chest. 
Yachno repeated the ritual proprieties, leaving Chris and Penelope to take their places. The bell tolled, and Penelope began to close immediately. Chris used gale step in bamboo form, finishing the second sigil just as Penelope whipped up a three-yard tall tornado and sent it coursing across the field. Chris cut dead sails to banish the tornado, relishing as they saw appreciation cross Penelope's face. They might not need to win if they impress the battle mistress enough. What else do you have? Chris thought, eager to prove themselves. Penelope was the second tallest warder of the circle, more muscular than Lavinia. The Vanian style called for extensive blade contact, dominating the battle through leverage and winding motions. The Vanian birthright of endurance meant that Chris wouldn't even try to tire out the battle mistress, but her heavier blade was also slower to cut and trace sigils. If speed alone wouldn't suffice, Chris would have to innovate. Fortunately, that was a Rumikun specialty. As Penelope closed, Chris backpedaled and cut twin blade, an intricate sigil developed on Ikado centuries ago. They'd learned it from a rare manuscript acquired by a Rumikun trader. As the sigil completed, Chris's free hand was filled with a sword made of blue light. It was an exact copy of Chris's steel blade duplicated by the sigil. The blade wouldn't last long, so it was more a trick than a sustainable strategy. Chris had trained in case of rapier-style swordplay and knew that the best way to lose when fighting with two blades was to let your opponent trap both blades at once, which meant Chris had to make this count. They pushed off their back leg, advancing toward Penelope as she closed. Chris moved from stance to stance, one blade high, one low. Each time Chris moved, they parried the weakest end of Penelope's blade with one sword and jabbed with a thrust using the other. Penelope wheeled to one side, blade moving nimbly to turn Chris's thrusts aside. Chris continued to press, taking measure of Penelope's timing and her use of leverage. Then, as Penelope pushed the magic blade aside with a forceful parry, Chris dropped the sigil. The blade vanished. With nothing to oppose Penelope's blade, her sword darted offline and Chris lunged. Penelope recovered incredibly well, raising her cross guard to parry, exactly as Chris expected. Chris disengaged under Penelope's guard and cut through the leather gauntlets into the battle mistress's forearms, drawing a thin line of blood. They stopped the blow short of striking her face, making a display of their control. The bell rang twice. Chris restrained a whoop of victory. They sheathed their blade and bowed to Penelope. I can hardly believe that worked, Chris thought. On another day, or on any other pass, Penelope might have caught the parry and punished them for going all in on the lunge. But it had worked. Penelope offered a hand to shake. The size of her hand left Chris feeling like they were a child again, shaking the hand of an adult. Excellently done, Chris. Penelope switched her grip and lifted Chris's hand up to the ceiling, raising her voice to the room. Vania values strength, and by trial of prowess, Rumika has shown its worth. The crowd cheered. Louder, more enthusiastic than that morning. They were on Chris's side. Thank you, Warder Kirkos. It was an honor. Just two more to go. But their best failed them that evening. Chris thought they'd be able to overwhelm Tato the way Lavinia had, but their aggression cost them the match when Tato avoided their blow with incredible agility. That left Chris off balance, which meant that they recovered too slowly and took a shallow cut to the side from the Sukiseni's curved blade. Your skills are admirable, but you still have much to learn, Tato said, casting his vote in opposition after the duel. At the close of the first day, the circle atop the challenge altar showed two flags illuminated, one dimmed. Chris returned to their guest chambers, not taking visitors from the crowd. Instead, they reclined with several ice packs and a cup of hot tea. On the table sat six polished stones with crude versions of the Circle Nation's flags painted on them. The stones for Kulo and Vania sat on one side, Tsukusen on the other. The three stones for the Imperial Nation sat in the middle. I can beat Takeshi, Chris said to himself. I just have to stay clear of his sigils long enough to force a battle into swordplay. With the Ikaro focus, I can't count on overwhelming him, so I'll just have to outfence him. But assuming that, I'll only have to win one more fight against Lavinia or Kensuke. Probably Kensuke. The reports say he's avoided duels over the past few years and favors his left leg. Chris's eyes settled on the Mertican flag. Lavinia's display in the Golden Lord question stuck with them. 
They'd run the two-on-one duel through their mind again and again and couldn't come up with a real weakness in Lavinia's form. Ojo had disarmed her with an incredible maneuver, and she snatched the blade out of the air to deliver the telling blow without a heartbeat's delay. A chill ran down Chris's spine, and they missed Alex's response. They looked up and saw resignation on Alex's face, fear and excitement on Nick's. Even if they couldn't beat Lavinia, the path to victory was clear. Hard, but clear. All of Rumika had put their trust in Chris. If they failed, Rumika could not challenge again for a decade, minus one year for each vote in support during the failed challenge, per the laws of the circle. A decade without a proper representative, without the respect a seat at the table could bring, without the binding power of deals made by a warder. They could not fail Rumika. They would not cost their people the future they were building. Chapter 4. Michiko That night, Michiko was in her room, reviewing quotas for millet and rice productions on Kakute when a summons came from Kensuke. She threw on a robe and hurried to the embassy's meeting room. She steadied her breath and walked into the main room, her head held high. She'd learned to walk into every room like Lavinia might be waiting to pounce. This time, she wasn't. Warder Hike sat at his desk, penning letters. Where the desk was usually spotless, here piles of books and papers had slumped over into a mess. Beside the warder sat a large mug of tea. The twitch of his hand, as he wrote, told her this was not his first that evening. Please, take a seat. He took a long sip, as she did, then set his mug down with an ungraceful clatter. What's wrong? Michiko wondered. She had not seen Kensuke so uncontrolled. Warder Junius has informed me that you are to face the young upstart in our stead, since you have already fought Chris and emerged triumphant. Kensuke looked tired, hollow. He walked around to Michiko and put his hands on her shoulders, holding her in his gaze. She froze in his grasp as a meteor shower of tiny movements and emotions crossed his face. She was trapped again between expectations. What does he want here? Did he want her to demur, to disagree? Something else? Lavinia should be here to give her clearer directions, though of course she could do what she wanted as the Empress's hand on Toife. Why me and not you? She asked, not because she needed the justification, but merely to break this moment, which felt more perilous by the heartbeat. Kinsuke released her shoulders and stepped back, shrinking in on himself. He turned, pacing as he spoke, not looking at her. We must each serve the best we can. The Empire is placing great faith in you, Michiko. Great faith in Kakute. The Golden Lord's escape was a strain on our status within the Empire. We must restore ourselves in Murtika's eyes. Kinsuke retrieved his mug from the desk. You will face the upstart last, after Warden Junius. And then he left. No further explanation. No coaching on strategy for the duel. Not even a good night. The room was still, silent, even as her thoughts whipped around her at gale force. She felt the pull to commune with her ancestors, just to feel less adrift and alone. First, Bologna wanted Michiko to follow through with her original instinct to connect with Chris. Then Lavinia wanted her to use that connection to force a wedge between Chris and Adetike. Now she wanted Michiko to stand in direct opposition and take up her sword against someone she'd been ordered to befriend. Michiko expected to have to oppose Chris at some point, but sending her forward instead of Warder Haike was a clear signal. It was both an insult to Rumika for Chris to have to face a junior instead of the senior warder, and an insult to Michiko to treat her inconsistently. Like all subjects, she was, of course, an instrument of the Empress's will, but would forcing her to be so antagonistic toward Chris likely sour them on her permanently? Preventing her from ever being able to recover the connection they'd had initially? In time, that sourness would fester. And what if Chris succeeded even with the switch-up? Michiko had bested Chris in the garden when they were hungover and angry, but the way they'd fought on the ship, beating them would not be easy. If she took up arms against Chris, they would not be the only one whose relationship to the Empire would be soured by the result. Michiko lit the incense, felt the beads in her hands and reached out to her ancestors for guidance. The Golden Lord emerged first. 
Good evening, granddaughter. Have you thought on my words, reflected on the ways that the Mertikans are abusing your loyalty? I wouldn't put it like that, she answered. But now they want me to fight Christan in Warder Heike's place. The Golden Lord's presence flowed into her mind like a storm ripping the shutters off their hinges. He crowded out the other voices, growing to fill her attention. For the gauntlet? Has it begun? What is the score? Kensuke has been a weak-willed lackey since we were children together. It's not surprising that Lavinia would call on you for this. Now is your chance to strike a blow for Kakute, for yourself. They've pushed you around since the moment you set foot on Toife. If Rumika joins the circle, the Empire becomes the minority. If you are to face Chris, you should let them win. Make it look close. Do this for me, for your people. The gauntlet has begun. Chris defeated Penelope and lost to Taro. They lost to Ojo as well, but Ojo voted in support. The result may fall to me, and I cannot throw a duel without serious repercussions. So they need only win twice more. What do you think about Takeshi's chances against Chris? It was so casual to him, a game to bet upon. I haven't seen Takeshi duel, but Bologna says he's useless with a blade. Chris is anything but. Excellent. If you throw the duel and Chris beats Takeshi, it doesn't matter what Lavinia does, short of killing the youth. Which would not go over well with Rumika. It might take them time to find another aspirant, but they'd not soon forget such an affront. Yes, this is the way forward. We can curb Lavinia's ambitions and force the Empire into the defensive while you rally the resistance on Kakute. He laid out her whole life for her, just as Lavinia had done, and Governor Gallus on Kakute before. And what will Lavinia do to me if I fail? She won't cast you aside so soon after forcing Kensuke out. He's not out, he's just not fighting this duel. The Golden Lord laughed, his amusement and confidence echoing throughout her mind. We'll see about that. Make it look good. Lavinia will rage and fume, but if she needs you now, she'll need you again soon. What do you say, uncle? Aunt? How long will you let yourself be constrained by fear? The Golden Lord asked. I was in prison for 40 years, but in my heart I was still free. Do not walk willingly into the cage they forced on me. He'd call for anything that reduced Martika's power, but did he care for Rumika at all? What would be best for Chris's people? The power of a seat in the warder's circle came with great responsibility and put them into play. Other nations would seek to gain advantage from Rumika, their airstone, their fleet, a supporting voice in each of the personal agendas and vendettas. But if Chris failed, they could return home, live out their lives as Rumika had done for centuries, staying above the fray. Michiko imagined what life would be like if she failed out of her role on Toife. Sent back home to be a bodyguard or to the fleet as a navigator? Would it be so bad? Chris clearly wanted more for Rumika, and Rumika wanted more for their people. But what did she want? And could it really matter, caught between a web of obligations? One false move and she'd be prey, eaten up and cast aside as Kensuke had been. The Golden Lord receded, the storm of his intensity rolling out from her mind. Her aunt's presence rushed forward, wrapping around her mind like a blanket. You absolutely cannot go against the Empress, my dear Michiko. Her uncle joined them, his attention like a steadying hand on her shoulder. Mertikans only respect excellence results. You cannot fail them when they've called upon you like this. If Warder Junius has asked you to fight, it must be because she believes in you. You must prove that her confidence was well placed. The two did their best to talk her down, to soothe her worries. But when the incense was doused, her attention back in the embassy, she had none of the clarity she'd sought. She'd been raised to honor her ancestors, to let their wisdom guide her. But when they contradicted one another so violently, she could not hope to satisfy them all. She'd been boxed in. No matter what she did, someone would be disappointed. Chapter 5. Chris Thanks to strongly brewed Luoa tea and the exhaustion of the gauntlet, Chris managed some sleep. They woke with aches and bruises, which they met with a hot bath. An imperial messenger arrived as they were finishing, the day's schedule. Unable to wait, Chris opened the letter in their robe, quickly scanning the contents. First, Chris would face Takeshi from Ikaro. 
Thank the elder Slovenia isn't first, Chris thought, a bit of tension bleeding from their body. Lavinia from Mertika second. Chris had no doubt that it would be their toughest fight of the gauntlet. And third, where Chris expected to see Kensuke from Kakute, the letter read Oda no Michiko. Michiko, who Chris had dueled and lost to. Michiko, who had seen more of how Chris fought than anyone on the island save Ojo and Adechike. What is this? Chris asked later, emerging from the bathroom, holding the letter aloft. What? Nick asked, looking up from polishing the Rumikan sword for the day's use. I'm to fight Michiko, not Kansuke. Why would they do that? Alex walked in from the sitting room, attendants trailing them with questions about the celebration party Rumika would be throwing if they won. Alex raised a hand. They saw Chris, nodded, and left the room. Nick continued. Michiko? Yes, Michiko, not Kensuke. Why? Kensuke is the senior. I should be fighting him. Kensuke might be unwell, Nick offered. It could be one of many things. Alex added, an insult, overconfidence, or a necessary substitution due to illness, as Nick said. But it doesn't change anything. Just two more victories. Not answers, not motives. Just focus and follow through. Yes, but why? Chris thought as they made their preparations. The crowd on the second day was even larger than the first. Takeshi looked more put together than usual. He was freshly shaven, his hair tied in a high top knot. His blade was short to make blade crafting easier with a clamshell hilt, doubtless for the hand protection. As the two walked to the center to shake, Chris smiled, butterflies in their stomach that they channeled into relentless positivity. I like this look. I can never make top knots work. Gave me a headache. Takeshi's response was only a nod. Not in a chatty mood then, Chris thought. They shook, and Yokno addressed the crowd again as the pair took their positions. Chris expected Takeshi to open with an attack. Keep your feet, boost speed on the way in, and then crowd them. Take away the space to craft, Chris thought. They expected the duel to be tiring. They'd need to wear the Ikaran down unless they landed a lucky touch through his defenses. The bell rang, and Chris charged. Takeshi traced a wide sigil, split the sky. Chris cut bamboo form as Takeshi finished the sigil, then used its power to dive five yards to the side to dodge the blue-white bolt of electricity from Takeshi's sigil. The lightning arced around again for another try. This time, Chris dropped to the floor, letting the energy fork over them and back toward Takeshi, who banished the sigil with a deft flick of the wrist. Such control, Chris thought. In Takeshi's place, Chris wouldn't have had the time to banish the lightning. But this one I know. Chris thought as they traced the counter sigil to Takeshi's blazing bolt. Takeshi's artistry with the sigil was too strong, too deft for Chris to stop it entirely on the run, but they disrupted it enough to cancel some of the blasts. The bolts lashed out like scattershot from a cannon. But there was a hole in the middle of the blossoming array of magic. It was risky. And Chris imagined Alex's voice warning them off, but instead, using the reflexes enhanced by bamboo form, they jumped forward, blade first, stretching out to become a dart through the air. Chris dove and rolled through without a scratch, coming up within range of the Ikaran. Chris beat the shorter blade aside and began to work at Takeshi's defenses. The crowd burst into applause, but the fight wasn't done yet. Chris pressed the Ikaran. Even retreating, Takeshi's precision was impressive. He traced short, precise sigils that pushed Chris away, then another that cost their footing. Each gave Takeshi time to retreat and start the next sigil. It was a parade of small disruptions and escapes. Each time Takeshi pulled out an escape, the crowd cheered. Chris couldn't just go for an all-out press without risking taking a counter-strike along the way, so instead they used their footwork. Watching Takeshi's movements, Chris tested right, tested left. Takeshi favored a back-weighted stance, which meant that there was only so far he could go before he had to step back. Chris used their flexible stance, weight forward, then back, left, then right, and faked Takeshi into taking a sudden step back, losing his balance. But instead of following, Chris cut Gale step to enhance their speed on top of the agility. Takeshi was off balance as he traced the counter sigil, so Chris closed again. Their blade whistled through the air, gaining time on Takeshi with each cut and parry. Just a bit more, they thought. Chris advanced again, disengaging around Takeshi's sword, planning to press with disengages and feints until they could gain at the fraction of a beat they needed to land a blow. He parries, I disengage again. But there was no parry. The blow sliced through Takeshi's side, yellow sash going red. 
shit. What? Shit. He should have parried. I I didn't mean to land that. Not that hard. Chris shouted, Medic! Even before the bells rang out. The Mertikan doctor dashed across the field, but Chris was already there, putting pressure on Takeshi's wound. I'm sorry. I I didn't mean to... Takeshi looked down, surprised. It was a fair blow. I should have caught it. The medic's voice was sharp. Move aside. But Chris kept their hands in place, maintaining pressure. I'm holding the wound. You cut away his tunic. Let me do my job, Rumikan. You made your point. Alex was there beside them. They'd lost track of the crowd, focusing on Takeshi. It had been an accident. But would anyone believe that? Alex tugged at their shoulder. Chris let her work. I'll be fine, Takeshi said. Chris saw no resentment or anger in his eyes, but guilt still hung around their neck like dead airstone. Alex offered them a cloth, which Chris used to clean the blood from their hands, from their sword. This was all wrong. Chris looked over their shoulder. Lavinia, Michiko, and Bologna stood around Takeshi as the medic worked. Lavinia prowled the edge of the group, her knuckles white on her blade. She caught Chris's gaze, and Chris's stomach dropped. She looked like she would take Chris's head off if given half a chance. She'd have that chance, and soon. We need to leave, Chris said. Of course, Alex said. I have chilled hibiscus tea waiting. Seldom had winning a duel felt as much like losing. Chapter 6, Ojo Ojo found Chris in the temporary chambers they'd been given on the ambassadorial level of the tower. They had a towel over their head, a mug of iced tea at their side. Chris threw back the towel as Ojo and Penelope entered. They were troubled, doubtless due to Takeshi's wound. Would that all of the warders had such compassion for their opponents after winning a duel. Are you all right? Uh, If you wish to be alone, I apologize. Uh, We... Ojo looked at Penelope. We'd both like to see Lavinia's ego deflated a few sizes, she said. I... I didn't mean to strike Takeshi that hard. I thought I had better control than that. It happens, Penelope said. The wound was not that deep, and the Mertikan obsession with excellence extends to their medics. He's in good hands. You need to focus on Lavinia. They made a circle of their chairs, Chris sitting back against the wall, relaxed but attentive, and Ojo and Penelope gave their advice. Unfortunately, they could not agree in their suggestions. Ojo raised a finger, pointing. Against Lavinia, even the smallest error can be your undoing. You can't count on the brash chances like your dive through Takeshi's array of bolts. No, Penelope said. That boldness is exactly what will let you surprise her. Harness it without losing your control, and you fight inside her range. Use her long limbs against her. But that will expose them to grappling, Ojo said. I've seen your wrestling skills, Chris. Uh, I mean, no offense, but you would not defeat Lavinia in Korakor. None taken. I'm not much of a wrestler. Penelope shook her head. You can fight inside her optimal range without letting her get her hands on you. It will be a tight rope, but it can be done. You're fast. You think well on your feet. If you stay out of range, she'll rout you with sorcery. And if you try to pick at her, she'll lend a quick blow to your wrist or forearm, and that'll be the end of it. Ojo nodded. You can do both. Be deliberate. Keep your head on. Be prepared for anything. Expect everything. She's a terror, but she can be beaten. How often have you beaten her? Chris asked. Twice, Ojo said. Three times, said Penelope. Out of how many duels? Too many, Ojo said. Fifteen, Penelope answered. Chris gulped audibly. Ojo put a hand on their shoulder. You are young, yet there's something to be said for not fighting this one too hard, Chris. Save your strength for Michiko. You'll have many chances over the years to learn how to get the best of Lavinia. Penelope's face soured. If Vanians knew the concept of throwing a match, they never acknowledged it. Chris's brow furrowed, as if the idea hadn't occurred to them either. Was it due to pride or the folly of youth? In the end, it didn't truly matter for now. Thank you, Chris said. I'll do my best. No matter what else happens today... You've proven your skills, Ojo said. And if the fates are with you, by tomorrow, we will get to call you Warder. The two stood, then left Chris to make their preparations for the duels ahead. Do you think they can do it? Penelope asked once they were out of earshot. Lavinia? 
I think not. But they have a good chance to beat Michiko, if they fight smart and don't get carried away with the adventure of it all. And if Lavinia leaves them in any shape to fight. Chapter 7 Michiko Michiko watched from the Mertikan huddle as Lavinia strode out for her duel. Takeshi sat tall beside her as if to wave off doubts about his health and stamina. He could have easily retired to his embassy to sleep the day off, but he insisted on staying. Beside her, Bologna said, How long do you think the upstart can last? I don't give them more than 30 seconds. I think the duel will last as long as Lavinia wants it to last, Michiko responded, keeping her tone neutral. Her telling moment was coming ever closer, and Grandfather's words lingered with her. Obligation and opportunity weighed on a scale atop her heart. Chris opened with sigils of speed and strength while Lavinia launched immediately into shockwave. Chris leaped over the rumbling wave of earth but barely dodged the follow-up bolts from blazing bolt. Lavinia was relentless, flowing from one sigil immediately into the next with no motion wasted. Dodging and blocking as best they could with counter sigils and adamant shield, Chris slowly closed the distance between them. The look of joyful concentration they'd worn in previous duels quickly gave way to a harder, colder look, all traces of a smile gone. Chris looked like Michiko felt whenever she communed with her grandfather, overwhelmed. And yet they pressed the fight. Lavinia slashed high as they came in, and Chris ducked into their parry, the blade striking sparks as it cut just above the Rumikun's head. Chris whipped the blade around to cut at Lavinia's wrist, but she was too fast, turning to parry the strike while carving a new sigil, Divine Gust, which blew the smaller duelist back. Chris kept their feet, but barely. Lavinia advanced while Chris struggled to keep their footing. But instead of landing one of three easy blows Michiko would have used, Lavinia lashed out with a heavy kick to Chris's side, knocking them back and down. The duel was to first blood, not the first strike. Lavinia closed again, hammering on Chris's defenses, and Michiko could nearly feel the strain of the blows, flashing back to her own brutal training sessions with Lavinia. She was as harsh a tutor as Michiko had ever known. But this was not instruction. It was naked cruelty. Lavinia dragged the fight out, landing body blows and pommel strikes, sigils with percussive attacks, and slaps with the flat of her blade. Chris began to leave openings, either from fatigue or perhaps inviting a blow to end their misery. But Lavinia refused to take the obvious shots. Enough, Lavinia! Ojo shouted from the sidelines. Michiko looked to the crowd. Some had turned away. Some cringed. Some looked on with bloodthirsty eagerness, mostly Lavinia's fellow Imperial subjects. She forced herself to look back at the duel despite the sick feeling in her stomach. Chris landed at Perry and pushed backward to make distance between them and reset the fight. The Rumikun was battered, but not beaten. They cut a new sigil, one Michiko had not seen before. Vex mirrors, Takeshi said beside her. Where did they learn that? Where Chris stood, there were now three of them. The Chris on either side began to circle, moving to flank Lavinia. Parlor tricks, Lavinia sneered, her commander's voice filling the room. She banished one image with a bolt of fire, then dodged between the two remaining, parrying through one's cut and spinning in time to block the true Chris's cut. But barely. For the first time in the duel, Lavinia was not in full command of the situation. As she pushed the cut aside, Lavinia's demeanor changed, sharpened. She counter-thrust with incredible speed. Chris barely dodged to the side, bringing their blade back around to defend. Lavinia hailed blows upon them, giving Chris less and less time to retreat or recover. The images forgotten, Lavinia pressed forward, knocked Chris's blade to one side, reached out to grab their sword with a gloved hand, then closed and headbutted the smaller fencer, knocking them flat on their back. Call it! shouted Alex from the opposite side of the pitch. But there was no blood upon the ground, nor on Chris's face. Lavinia held Chris's blade, leaving them nearly defenseless. But instead of letting Chris yield, her blade lashed out, stabbing deep into the shoulder of Chris's sword arm. Finally, Yokno's bell rang. It is done, the seneschal bellowed. You are not ready, whelp, she spat. Crawl back home and remember this the next time you think to challenge the Empire. Lavinia stepped back, saluted Yokno, then tossed Chris's blade at their feet. Rumika's medic rushed to Chris's side, along with their attendants. Takeshi shot up and moved for the Rumikun as well, far faster than she would have expected. 
This was the Mertican ideal she was supposed to strive for? Uncompromising and cruel victory at all costs? If Lavinia was the Empress's hand and toife, then in the Empress's eyes all were useful tools or doomed hurdles to be crossed and shattered. Who was she really fighting for? And who was she expected to hurt along the way? Enough is enough, she thought. Michiko stood and crossed to join the group around Chris. She was the warder empowered to face Chris, and therefore she could set the terms of that duel. She would not compound cruelty on cruelty. The Rumikan medic treated Chris's wound, but from up close, Michiko saw that there was no way they'd be able to fence that night. Michiko sought out Yokno, who lingered by the side of the arena. Kakute proposes that the final duel be postponed until tomorrow. Yokno raised an eyebrow. That is very considerate. As you stand for Kakute in this gauntlet, I can convey the offer to the aspirant, if you like. If Lavinia and the Empress were trusting her to represent Kakute, then she would set an example. Kakute would show the nations that they could balance strength and compassion. Thank you, Seneschal. She bowed and returned to her seat. Lavinia was waiting for her. She considered turning and leaving, but that would only delay the inevitable. What did you tell the Seneschal? Lavinia asked. Bologna flanked her, as always. I offered the aspirant the chance to delay the final duel. They are clearly in no shape to present a challenge, and when I beat them, I want the outcome to be undeniable. If we seek to deny Rumika, we cannot do so if the other warders believe that Chris could have won the final duel if they'd only been given time to recover. You are too generous, Lavinia said. You must take every advantage presented to you, especially with your lack of training in the proper imperial techniques. Do not fail the Empire, Michiko. Everything came down to results. No room for emotion, no room for mercy. This was the standard Lavinia set. But in the fury of a storm, a tree that refused to bend would break. Was the Empire the tree or the storm? Michiko bowed, hiding her face from Lavinia's watchful eye as she set her expression. I will do my best, Warder. Something had changed within her during that fight. But could she betray her oath of loyalty? Even to correct an injustice? Chapter 8 Chris Instead of the evening duel, Chris took a long bath, trying to unknot their muscles. Afterward, they sat with ice packs in a reclining chair, both grateful for the delay for the final duel and worried that one night of rest would not be enough. Nick leaned into the main room of the guest quarters, saying, Warder Ueda is here to see you. Chris stood, which set their shoulder on fire once more. They slumped back in their seat and took a moment to let the pain dull. Moving slower, they stood and said, Of course, send him in. Takeshi wore a fresh set of robes and carried a well-worn leather satchel in one arm. Good evening, warder. I wasn't expecting you. There was no reason to expect me. Again, I'm very sorry, Takeshi cut them off. There's nothing to apologize for. I missed the parry, and your blow struck me. I'm the one who should be apologizing for Warder Junius. I have some skill with medicinal poultices, and I wanted to offer what assistance I might. I might wonder why you're offering to help me when the last person I'm scheduled to duel is another imperial subject. Takeshi knelt and unfolded his pack, revealing freshly cut herbs, mosses, and a rainbow of vials. Dueling is hard enough when you're healthy, and everyone benefits if the results of this gauntlet is without question. Muddied waters are likely to breed resentment and reprisal. Chris nodded, taking in Takeshi's words. Well said. I am grateful for whatever help you can provide. They'd need it. Even with a night to recover, they'd be fighting Michiko left-handed and exhausted. Chris pulled off the arm of their loose tunic and let Takeshi and Nick remove the bandage. Takeshi's hands were warm, despite the cool night air. He worked skillfully, tender, but not forceful, cleaning the wound again before applying the poultice. Did you ever consider being a physician? It's what I wanted before I was called to serve as a blade crafter. We have many doctors, but few duelists. Our governor decreed that my talent for blade craft was too great to waste on healing. Nick held one layer of the poultice on while Takeshi mixed several liquids in a bowl. 
Here I have access to the finest library in the sky, so I keep my medical skills as honed as I can. Help the doctors on the lowest level, sometimes. The city doesn't do the best job of taking care of its poor. He dabbed a brush in the mixture, then painted it into the poultice. The liquid seeped through, and Chris's shoulder went cold, then numb. Few cities do, Chris said. That's amazing. What is it? That, I'm afraid, is an Ikaran secret. His smile told Chris that he was joking. He taped down the bandages and stood. If anything starts turning green, remove the poultice immediately and send for me, but that's a very rare reaction, and as I've read, almost unheard of on Rumika. Nick nodded. We're hardy people, not in the league with Vanians, but we hold up. Chris here is proof of that. Chris offered their free hand to shake. It was a bit awkward, but they managed. Thank you again, Wardu Ueda. You have my gratitude and that of Rumika. You're very welcome. Now, do your people proud tomorrow and see this through. Takeshi bowed haltingly, then took a long moment before he seemed to remember that he was leaving and made his way out. Now, that was unexpected, Chris thought, the image of Takeshi's smile and the deft touch of his trained hands lingering long after he'd gone. Chris woke the next day dreading the pains and aches they were due. But instead of a sharp stabbing, their shoulder reported only a dull throb, and their other bruises were far smaller and lighter than expected. Chris penned a letter of appreciation to Takeshi, which Nick dutifully delivered, along with one for Michiko. Out of curiosity, Chris tested their sword arm, extending, flexing, holding their blade. It hurt, but not enough to be worth fighting left-handed. They might not be at full strength, but they'd finish the gauntlet today. They'd see whether Takeshi's kindness and Michiko's mercy gave them the space to win, or rope enough to hang their own chances. Chapter 9, Michiko the crowd assembled after lunch for the sixth and final duel of Chris's gauntlet. Michiko kept moving, light on her feet, kicking out the worry and trying to stoke the flames of her aggression. She'd slept poorly, conflicting loyalties and desires refusing to resolve or go quiet. She could not afford to do less than her very best with this crowd watching, from Lavinia to the dozens of imperial subjects in the crowd. The Empire was counting on her to deliver them a victory especially after she'd extended Chris the courtesy of delaying the duel. Chris walked on to the pitch with their medic in attendance. Their gait was a bit stiff, but they moved with resolve. Michiko put on a mask of politeness to hide her storm-tossed heart. She'd hoped to have a decision about what to do in the duel when she woke, whether to follow Lavinia's orders or her grandfather's. What little sleep she'd found had not brought clarity, only the feeling of a steel fist wrapped around her stomach breath permanently caught in their throat. As the two closed to shake, Michiko nodded to Chris. You look well? Thank you, they grinned. I don't suppose I can convince you to pledge your support regardless of the duel's outcome? If only it were that simple, Michiko thought. Lavinia would skin me alive and then send me to run errands as I bled out. Not unless you are planning to announce Rumika's intention to join the Empire. Alas, no. <laughs> But at least this time, I'm not hungover, shall we? Chris raised their blade to salute. Michiko matched them. Yokno repeated the terms, and the two returned to their ready positions. Chris opened as they usually did with sigils of speed and agility. Michiko matched them one to one. They traded attacks from a variety of sigils, closed and backed off, testing each other's defenses. Chris was moving stiffly, but so was she, thanks to lack of sleep, undigested worry, and uncertainty. Their last duel, Chris had been tired and angry. Here, they were bold, without being brash, daring but not sloppy. Michiko found no easy openings to capitalize on, nor any convincing places where she could slip up. Her mind flipped between options at the tempo of the fight, thoughts and impulses never breaking through her resolve to guide her actions. Both she and Chris were playing waiting games, probing for an opportunity. Chris for their chance to strike, Michiko for the telling moment that would let her decide and be done with this torment. The crowd was a din, with only rare voices piercing the cacophony. Finish them, Michiko heard from Lavinia. Focus, shouted Ojo. Michiko cleared Chris's blade and took a large step back, giving herself a breather. Chris's aggression could be used against them. She just had to create the moment without leaving an opening for Chris's tricks. 
She decided to use one of her own, this one she'd picked up from Lavinia, watching her use it to chase Bologna around the pitch. It did make a good impression on Lavinia, at least. Or maybe it was to win and be done with the fight. She still couldn't tell which part of her was lying to herself. Michiko stepped back again as Chris closed, keeping her sword out of the way of Chris's as she drew the sigil Arcane Beast. A luminescent bear made of golden light snapped into being, rearing up on two legs between Michiko and Chris. The crowd gasped. Summoning creatures with bladecraft was a rare and difficult feat. Win or lose, she'd shown her prowess here, or would if she could control the construct and continue the fight. Where'd she learn this one? Chris said, keeping the bear between the two of them. Michiko did not answer, focusing on the fight. She fainted, then pushed off in reverse direction, hoping to startle the Remican. It would have worked if not for the torso-sized sigil of counter-magic Chris etched in the air. Intricate and taxing, pure counter-magic was a brute force measure. Far better to reverse the sigil itself, but doing so required knowing the specific sigil in question well enough to cut it backward. What Chris did was the equivalent of using a cannon to fell a tree for lack of an axe. But it worked. Lunging, the beast shattered into a kaleidoscope of magical energy, fizzling out. And through the sparkling lights, Chris stepped forward to attack again. Michiko ducked and parried the cut, and they reset. On another day, with another objective, this would have been fun. Matching sigil for sigil, testing each other, pushing each other to do more, fight faster, dig deeper. They reached a fever pitch of feint and counter, cut and thrust, neither quite landing a blow nor willing to retreat. But this had to end sometime. Just do something she told herself, frustrated. The two came to the clash, opposed cuts meeting in a perfect cross. Michiko felt Chris's blade, weak on the inside line. All she had to do was push through. Here it is. I can do it. She imagined the scene. Lavinia proud, Chris devastated. The adoration of the Empire. But instead, she let the moment pass. Chris reversed around Michiko's blade and swung at her forehead. She dodged to the side, and her sword swept toward Chris's knee. They leaned back in an acrobatic move, all their weight on their back leg, and her blade cut only the air. Chris responded by knocking Michiko's weapon aside. Michiko stepped back and brought up her blade to guard against the expected follow-up, but Chris's sword wasn't there. Instead, they dove under Michiko's blade and scored a light cut across her calf. Chris rolled up to a guard position. Michiko felt the hot sting of the cut and stepped back. Yokno's bell rang twice. It was done. Chris had won, though only because Michiko had seen an opportunity and let it pass. Would Lavinia be able to tell what had truly happened? Would Chris? When Michiko switched her sword to her free hand, Chris sheathed their own, not to shake. Instead, they launched forward, tackling Michiko with a hug. What a fight! They squeezed with more warmth and camaraderie than she'd gotten from the entire Imperial delegation put together. This is why, Michiko thought, the Empire sees me as a tool. Chris sees me as a person. Maybe even a friend. Michiko squeezed Chris back and then pulled away. The moment was done. There was no purpose in acting the sore loser, even to appease Lavinia. She grabbed Chris's hand and raised it to the ceiling, shouting, To the victor! The audience erupted into cheers, even some imperial subjects. Lavinia was not among them. Michiko's stomach dropped at the thought of the lashing she'd get, weeks of accounting duty or cleaning or another tedious task. Lavinia would take it out on her on the field, in the halls and everywhere in between. She was afraid of the retribution, but not ashamed of what she'd done. Michiko nodded to Chris and then returned to face Lavinia. It was a good duel. She'd done well. Chris would have their seat. Romika would have a say, and the wheels of change would turn. But what would come next? Chapter 10. Chris. As Michiko stepped away, Chris fell to their knees, overwhelmed. Pain, triumph, pride, fear, worry, and wonder all scrambled in their mind. I did it. I actually did it, Chris thought. Chris channeled all those competing impulses into a bellow of triumph, letting themselves empty their mind and still their heart. Chris stood, retrieving their blade and making their way to Yokno. Celebration could wait. There was still one bit of ceremony left. 
The gauntlet is complete, Yokno exclaimed, his voice carrying effortlessly. The count stands four supporting, two opposed. And so, as seneschal of the warder's circle, I confirm this result. The participating warders, join me upstairs for the ritual of investiture. On behalf of the circle and Toife, thank you for bearing witness to this most momentous ritual. I am made to understand that the people of Rumika are prepared to host a celebration nearby, in the Grand Opera Hall. Chris pulled himself together, calling up the first of several speeches they'd prepared. Rumika wishes to share our excitement and appreciation with all who bore witness and participated in this gauntlet. Rumika is ready to take our place among the great nations of the sky, to share our culture, our history, and our strength. Please do us the honor of joining us tonight for the celebration. The six warders stood around the table, ritual blades in hand. The table had six seats, six flags carved into the marble, as it had since before anyone in the room had been born. The table was about to change. The warders took a step back in unison, each carving the same sigil. Chris and Yokno stood off to the side, along with the junior warders. No others were allowed to bear witness, Yokno explained. This sigil is held in confidence by the circle specially designed to resonate with the ancient magics that sustain this wondrous tower. Lavinia did not bother to contain her anger, but she cut the sigil regardless. Blade work perfect. Taro looked displeased, but not angry, and in Michiko's place, Kensuke cut the sigil for Kakute, expression unreadable. Ojo wore a smile, a Penelope a satisfied and resolute look of appreciation, if not affection. And Takeshi snuck in an upward curl of the lip out of eye shot of his fellow Imperial warders. The sigils snapped into place one by one, and as the six completed, the table rumbled, becoming lighter and lighter until it was pure white magical energy. Then at once there was a great settling sound, stone dropping into place without falling. The light faded, revealing the enlarged table, fresh with a seventh place, a seventh seat, and a seventh flag. Rumika's gold chimera on red and white looked back at Chris from the table, bisected by the groove for a sword. A warder's sword. Yokno gestured to the seat. Step forward, Chris Den of Rumika. Chris took their place in front of the seat, presenting their blade. The blade that had lain in a box since their departure from Rumika, untouched until now. Blessed by the elders of each village, with a pommel made from polished airstone from the lowest point on the island, the sword represented how the warder would bear up their people. They took the blade and set it into the groove on the table. Another flash and Chris saw countless ribbons of light lashing up from the table and wrapping themselves around the sword, snapping into place and fading from vision. And so, Yokno said, the circle is increased. Congratulations and welcome, Warder Den. The warders clapped, even Lavinia, though she did so over dagger eyes. Thank you all, Chris said. I look forward to serving alongside each of you, learning from your experience, and doing my best to honor the mission of this circle, to foster greater peace and understanding between the nations. I hope you'll all join me at the celebration this evening, and then I think I'll be sleeping until the next meeting. That got a chuckle, and not just for Mojo. The rest of the day was a whirlwind. Alex and Nick had taken most of the preparations on themselves, with a corps of volunteers and the staff of the Grand Opera. The multi-tiered foyer had been done up in the red and white of Rumika, with great banners, ribbons, and carpets adorning every surface. There, on a middle tier, Rumikan cooks and chefs shared traditional meals from the islands, from apricot pheasant to quelled tarts and everything in between. Chris made sure to stop at the tables each time they passed, if only to eat enough to stay upright after their exhausting week. Their attire and hair helped force them to take it slow. It was the most elaborate outfit they'd ever worn. Alex had insisted on extravagance. A half dozen Rumican tailors had competed to dress Chris for the celebration, and they'd ended up wearing a grandiose version of Rumican traditional wear, another way in which they were being made to stand for their whole country. They wore a fitted jacket that opened into voluminous gourd sleeves in contrasting red and white with gold trim, and a full skirt with a separate section drawn up and pinned to the shoulder as a cape that then draped into a long tail. 
Their hair was pulled tight from their left side and draped over their left shoulder. Wavy tresses pulled into swirling knotted braids at their crown, then falling over their shoulder in intricately formed curls. On the lowest level, a Rumican band played folk tunes as their companion dance troupe performed traditional dances, teaching foreigners the simple steps and inviting them to join in the dances of harvest, of marriage, and more. The troupe roped Chris into joining them for one go at Chimera's March, a celebratory dance from Chris's home village. Blatant pandering, to be sure, but as the leaders beckoned Chris into the center to play the role of the Chimera, Chris's heart soared. The warders and diplomatic entourages mostly kept to the reserved upper level. It was the easiest place to catch one's breath, but the most socially fraught. A reminder that more than ever, their every move would be scrutinized. As the hero of the hour, Chris had to be on the entire time, gracefully receiving thanks, making the acquaintance of local dignitaries, political actors of all stripes and creeds, and dozens of grateful rumicans, each with a story about how they just knew Chris would win. Chris tried to commit every name to memory, but knew they'd remember barely a fraction if not for the small bound book they kept in their jacket, jotting notes down after each encounter. Chris picked out a moment when Takeshi was alone by the refreshments, then slid in through the crowd. Thank you, again, that poultice worked wonders. Surprised, Takeshi nearly dropped his dish. The food wobbled and Chris shot out their hand to steady his plate. Their hands touched and Chris felt that same warmth again. You're very welcome, Takeshi said. You look... Takeshi! Lavinia cut him off from across the landing. Are you quite done? Takeshi gave Chris a quick bow, said congratulations, then returned to the imperial cadre. They were a circle closed against the room, present but not participating. Is it so terrible for Takeshi to make friends? Chris wondered. Were the other imperial warders allowed any autonomy under Lavinia? Each warder was a puzzle that Chris would have to solve, made all the more complex because of their ever-changing connections. But that was a gauntlet for another day. Hours after the sun had vanished beneath the mists, once the diplomatic level was empty of the imperial delegation, Chris sought out Ojo. The big man was chatting with Adechike, Tato, and Nick, who shared a plate of Rumika's sweets. Warder Kante, may I have a word in private? Ojo excused himself, and the two stepped out onto a small balcony overlooking the city. The evening air wrapped its cool tendrils around Chris's hair, but the growing chill could not dim the warmth in their heart. The city is truly beautiful. The stained glass windows glowed by lantern light, banners whipping on rooftops. They saw buildings of every style and make, from the impossibly ancient tower to the wooden skeletons of new construction. Toffe lived the promise of the circle every day proving that the people of the nations could live together in harmony. You'll have plenty of chances to get to know it now, warder. Ojo added a warm touch to his voice with that last word, and Chris found an unbidden smile upon their lips. How long did it take you to get used to the title? Until the day I looked up from my work and realized I'd been senior for Kulo for a decade. Chris turned and saw Ojo's face alight with a smile. They answered in kind. I'll be sure to make a note to myself to be very careful about looking up. Somewhat dangerous for when I head down island for tea. Already you bear the wisdom of years. I think it's the tea. They laughed together, and for a moment, the burden of responsibility felt lighter. Chris took a long breath, felt the breeze in their hair. The past week had been so full, and Chris wanted to set this celebration off on its own so they would never forget it. Chris turned from the view to face Ojo. I wanted to thank you, Warder Conte. Ojo is fine. We are peers now, yes? Yes. Uh, Ojo, thank you for everything. I wouldn't have succeeded without your assistance, and not just because of your vote in the gauntlet itself. Ojo raised his glass to salute. The circle will be stronger with Seven. I don't expect you'll have an easy first year, given how the winds are blowing. The Imperials, Vanian's prejudice against Rumikan's birthright, and whatever other challenges to Chris's authority emerged as they established themselves in the circle. I never expected that it would be easy, Chris said. Lavinia won't let this go without some response. Which is why Rumika needs allies. Chris stood up to their full height, shoulders back, expression softened as they gave Ojo a conspiratorial smile. As my first act as warder, aside from all of this... Chris gestured back to the party. 
Rumika will offer Kulo the first chance to bid on exclusive trade rights for Rumika and Airstone. Kulo gets the relief it needs, and Rumika gets a strong partner in the sky. Ojo's face nearly glowed from within. Kulo is honored. This is what we've both been working for, and now we can bring it to fruition together. Shall we work out the details over tea? Chris smiled. The future lay before them, endless possibilities. Challenges, too, but they would not be alone. They had their people at their back, friends and allies on Toife, and the authority of a warder. They would forge a bright future for their people. Whatever else came next, Rumikan histories would remember this day as one of triumph. You're listening to Born to the Blade, Episode 4, by Michael R. Underwood, starring Exe Sands, produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Born to the Blade is created by Michael R. Underwood and written by Michael R. Underwood, Marie Brennan, Cassandra Kaw, and Malka Older. It is executive produced by Julian Yap and Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.